on location in the Holy Land. David Taverner from UCB travels with Bible teacher and church pastor Mike Beaumont to trace the life of Jesus then and now. We've got to the point in the story of Jesus that we call Holy Week and we're in the Garden of Gethsemane here in Jerusalem. Some traffic in the background, but it's fairly peaceful just here, surrounded by olive trees. My goodness me, in fact, there look to be a good crop on these trees, Mike. Yeah, there does, doesn't they? Uh, and it's interesting as we look out to them, some are obviously pretty young trees, but the thing that strikes me here is how old some of these are as we look at the olive trees with their gnarled branches and them winding around in odd shapes. And um, these particular olive trees are hundreds of years old. Now, they are almost certainly not olive trees that would have been here in the time of Jesus. We can't age olive trees because they don't have like the tree rings like other oh, right. trees do. So we can't age them from that sort of examination. But we do know from history that when the Romans besieged Jerusalem in the Jewish-Roman War, AD 66 to 70, and when they finally came here to destroy Jerusalem, the records say that they cut down all the trees here in the Kidron Valley where we are located and used it as part of building their attack mechanisms uh, for besieging the city. So they probably weren't here in the time of Jesus, but I tell you what, it doesn't half give us a sense of what it must have been like when he was here. Garden of Gethsemane may be overstating it. I mean, there aren't many sort of flowers and floral beds. It's not that kind of garden, is it? No, not at all. And of course, the word Garden of Gethsemane is perhaps how we would describe it these days. Um, it's an olive plantation, we would probably say these days. And stretching out from the Church of All Nations that is built here on the bedrock where it's said that Jesus agonised while he was in this garden is this whole area of olive trees. So it's an olive grove might be a, another word that we describe. It's certainly not the sort of garden we would, would talk about. And where are we in relation to, you know, old Jerusalem and the Mount of Olives and so on? Yeah. So if we imagine in our mind's eye a map of Jerusalem with Jerusalem over on our left-hand side, just to its right, to the east, we've got that Kidron Valley that we've spoken about before, the slopes coming down from the city to the bottom of that deep gorge, then up the other side on the Mount of Olives to the east of it. And the Garden of Gethsemane was a, an olive grove that was planted somewhere here. Was it this exact spot where we are seated today? I can't say that. But we know that it was very, very close to here where Jesus spent that night praying to his father before he would be arrested. So we're very close to old Jerusalem and where he would ultimately be crucified. Yeah, absolutely. Remind us what the Bible says about what happened here on that particular occasion. Well, we find this story in Matthew, Mark and Luke, the three synoptic gospels I've chosen to read from Matthew's gospel for our reading today. So we're in Matthew chapter 26 and verse 36. Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. Yet, not as I will, but as you will. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Couldn't you watch with me for one hour? He asked Peter. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the body is weak. Then he went away a second time and prayed, 
My father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. And when he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. So he left them and went away once more and prayed the third time, saying the same thing. Then he returned to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour is near. And the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. Three times Jesus had to come back to the disciples and three times he was praying. What's going on there? <laughs> he knows what's coming up. He knows that he is now so very, very close to the heart of the purpose for which he came, dying upon that cross. And the truth is, the thought of it horrified him. Now remember, Jesus was the eternal Son of God, become a real human being through the Incarnation. But he was a real human being. And as we've seen many times in this series, he experienced those real emotions of human beings. He got tired, he got hungry, he got thirsty, he wept. And when faced with this traumatic experience that was about to come upon him, he feels the anguish and agony and everything in him, frankly, would want to run. I mean, who in their right mind would sort of say, oh yeah, here I am, let's go ahead and do this, this will be cool. So he is feeling that anguish and the weight of it all. In fact, it's fascinating. This garden is called Gethsemane, which means olive press for obvious reason. Here are the olives. The olives would then be harvested. They were harvested by the branches being beaten with a stick. People would stand underneath it with a couple of people with a blanket to catch them as they fell down. And they would then be taken from there to the olive press. There were various types, but essentially, um, all olive presses involved one heavy stone pressing on another stone with the olives fed in between so that as the stone went round it, the oil from the olives was pressed out and it was then collected. And that's particularly appropriate for here because it is in this place, in Gethsemane, in the olive press place, where Jesus' life is pressed and crushed beyond measure until the life itself begins to come out of him. And yet his disciples are asleep. It's mad. Yeah, it's late. They're weary. We know it was late on the day. They've just come here from having that last supper together. So it was evening then. It's probably been a long and tiring day. You and I know that in this heat where it's often between 30 and 35, even while we've been here, um, you know, it's hard work and, and we've had the luxury of an air-conditioned vehicle to get around. They've not. They've been walking everywhere. So I think it's very understandable. You know, they're tired. It's the end of the day. It, it's late now. We know that Jesus was arrested at night. And, and, and so they're just nodding off, we might call it. It's not like they're saying, oh, you know, we lie down and have a seat. I think, you know, they're just nodding off. And even though he takes his three closest friends, Peter, James and John, do you remember the three took up? Mm. the mount with him for the mount of transfiguration these particularly close friends out of the 12 uh, he takes them a little further away from the disciples and and even they end up nodding off uh, listen i'm sure all of us can identify with this I, I suspect there's probably not one listener who hasn't nodded off while they've been praying i know i have you know you you sort of determined to pray and, and suddenly the next thing you know, you think, oh, um, half an hour's gone and you discovered you nodded off rather than you prayed, particularly if you're tired. It's a very human thing to do. And it's a very human thing, I think, that these disciples did, but it was at this moment when Jesus desperately needed friends. I love that. I love the thought that Jesus was so very much human he needed human presence. All of us need that at times, especially when we're facing challenges or life is tough, just to just to have someone there. It's not even saying anything. You know, it's like when we've lost a loved one, we, we don't need people to come and give us religious platitudes. But I tell you what, it's just great to have someone there 
even just sitting with us, being there, saying, yeah, I'm understanding, I'm here with you. And it's what Jesus wanted. He wanted his friends there, understanding, being with him, watching, praying with him. And yet they nod off while he's agonizing and seeking his father for what lies ahead. I mean, it certainly sounds as if he's disappointed in them. Would that be the case? I, I think he is. I mean, at one level, I don't think Jesus was ever disappointed because he knew what they were like. I think his heart sank. I think he was really hoping that by now, after having spent three years with them, they, they might have been in a place where they were starting to see, even if they didn't fully understand it, which they couldn't, that something important was going on here. This was important to Jesus. And, and yet weariness overtook them. So I, yeah, I think his heart did sink a bit at this point. I say that because disappointment is a very real experience for people, very real emotion. It can be very damaging, actually. It can. And of course, the issue then is uh, what we do with it. I don't think there's anyone who's ever lived who has not faced a disappointment, uh, either through circumstances or certainly through people. Every single one of us faces disappointment. But, you know, we have choice at that moment. We express our disappointment. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Jesus did here. But what will we do? Will we live in our disappointment? Will that person or that event or that circumstance ever hereafter be in a box marked disappointment or will we learn to forgive and move on i mean jesus certainly here is able to move on he's certainly able to forgive and i think it's so important that you know that we ask jesus to help us lord you knew what it was to be disappointed at this moment but you know you pulled yourself together why because you called on your father's help as you went to pray again Help me not to live in disappointment. Help me to refuse to live in disappointment. The devil loves it when we choose to live in disappointment rather than asking Father to help us leave it and walk out of it. You said like these olives uh, on the trees around us in this Garden of Gethsemane that are crushed, Jesus was crushed, but how far was he crushed? Oh, my goodness, uh, beyond measure. And... I, I think we see that in a number of ways. I mean, the Gospels tell us that he was sweating so much as he prayed that his sweat was, was like drops of blood coming from him. There was something physical going on because his anguish, his agony was so great. And why was his agony so great? Well, because of what he understood was about to happen. I'd just like to take us back to a couple of the verses again. You know, as he goes off and says to the guys, just keep watch with me, pray. He goes off a little further on his own. This is something between him and his father he's got to work out here. And he says, my father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. Two or three things out of that. David, first of all, may this cup be taken from me. You know, very often when we read that today, particularly in the West, we, we think of, oh yeah, the cup, the, um, the anguish that he was going to go through, the, the cross that he was going to go through. But I don't think that's what was in Jesus' mind at all. You see, for someone who'd been brought up as a Jew as Jesus had, he thoroughly understood what the imagery of the cup meant. In the Old Testament, a number of the prophets used the cup as a particular symbol. They spoke about the cup of God's wrath. Wrath means his righteous anger against sin. And several of the prophets saw that at the end of human history, God would take this cup that over the generations he'd been filling up, filling up, filling up every act of sin, as it were, put more righteous judgment into that cup until it was utterly filled. And at the end of human history, he would, well, some prophets see God is forcing people to drink that cup. Others see it as being poured out over them. This is the cup that Jesus is thinking about here, the cup of God's judgment on human sin. And he is horrified at the thought of having to drink it dry because he knows what it involves. 
He knows the pain he and his father and the Holy Spirit have felt from all eternity at the horror of human sin and what that has done to them. He knows how much that cup has been filled up and continues to be filled up to this day. And Jesus knows that at the cross, in just a few hours' time, he is going to take that cup and drink it. Wow, that is a powerful thought for us, by the way. We need have no fear of any cup of God's judgment being poured out over our life. Why? Because if we have put our faith and trust in Jesus, he has not only drunk the cup for me, he's wiped it dry. And there's not so much as one drop left in it to be poured over our heads if we've trusted in him. But first, he had to go and pay the price. So when he says, may this cup pass from me, he's saying, oh God, I see that this is the moment that we have planned together where I am about to go and pay the price, where I am about to drink the cup of righteous judgment on all human sin throughout humanity. And it horrifies me because of what he knew that involved, not just the pain of nails through his body, but the anguish of paying the price for sin and the separation from his father that that would bring about for a period of time. And so he says, God, if possible, please may this cup be taken from me. Little wonder he said that. But I love what he then says. Oh God, if possible, please take it away. Yet, not as I will, but as you will. I want your will, Lord, more than mine. Now, interestingly, when he goes back the second time, his prayer changes slightly. It's as if he's heard the Father confirming in his heart what he really knows. Because the second time he says, Father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away, ah, Different. The first one, he's asked, please may this cup be taken away. Now he's saying, okay, Father, if it isn't possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, then let your will be done. There's a shift. What a powerful picture that is. I mean, this is what prayer should do. This is what prayer ought to be about. In an earlier conversation, we spoke about how prayer is conversation with my heavenly father, not just talking, but listening to, not just bringing our shopping list of needs. And what Jesus does here is to come to the father with his desperate anguish as he knows what lies ahead and lays it before him. And he hears father saying, no, son, it, it is what we planned, isn't it? And then him coming back and saying, well, okay, Lord, if... Yeah, if this is what we've planned, then please, you know, can we please make sure your will is done? And I love it how his prayer is modified as he spends time with his father, each time yielding to the will of God, his father, but each time modifying it slightly in the light of what he's heard until he's lined up fully, wholly, completely with the purpose for which he came. We've spoken before about the prayers of Jesus, his prayer life, and how prayer was a priority. You seem to be saying that he'd understood that God's will was the number one priority. Yeah, absolutely. Um, He said in John's Gospel on one occasion, I can only do what I see my father doing. (laughs) You can't make God more of a priority than that. He he said in Matthew's gospel in the Sermon on the Mount, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. So doing what God wanted, what his Father in heaven wanted, was his number one priority. Why? Because he knew it was best. He knew it was best. Now, it was going to be painful, terribly painful, but he knew it was best. And, you know, there's quite a challenge for us today, isn't there, that, you know, when we hear what God tells us to do. Sometimes we might read a scripture and balk at it and think, oh my goodness, I don't like that. I confess, I will still read passages of the Bible and think, I don't like that. Not because I theoretically or theologically don't like it, but because if I'm going to take that seriously, something in me is going to have to change. But making God's will the number one priority in our lives is so important. To take us back to a story much earlier in our series, at the wedding of Cana, 
His mother Mary said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Like, you know, that's a great motto for life. Do whatever he tells you. Is it in his word? Do whatever he tells you. Trust him and trust the consequences to him because that's exactly what Jesus did here in this garden. And you said a moment or two ago that he wanted to have that human contact, human friends, those closest to him, with him at this crucial moment in his life. But they weren't all right by his side, were they? Well, no, they weren't <laughs> in a number of ways. Um, the disciples were here in this garden. Then, as we said, he took three of them off to be much closer to him. But, of course, there was one who wasn't by his side at all. Uh, and there was one of the 12. I, I still find this amazing that Jesus chose 12 and he knew that one of them would betray him. And it's right here in this garden where that betrayal will get outworked and, and come to a climax, the Apostle Judas, of course. Well, let's look at those verses in the Bible. Yeah, why don't we read on in the story from... Matthew 26, verse 46 is, is where we ended. Rise, let us go, here comes my betrayer. Now let's read on. While he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived. With him was a large crowd armed with swords and clubs sent from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is the man, arrest him. And going at once... To Jesus, Judas said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. And Jesus replied, Friend, do what you came for. Then the men stepped forward, seized Jesus, and arrested him. With that, one of Jesus' companions reached for his sword, drew it out, and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Put your sword back in its place, Jesus said to him. For all who draw the sword will die by the sword. Don't you think I can't call on my father and he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels? But how then would the scriptures be fulfilled that say it must happen this way? And Jesus said to the crowd, Am I leading a rebellion that you've come out with swords and clubs to capture me? Every day... I sat in the temple courts teaching and you didn't arrest me. But this has all taken place, that the writings of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all his disciples deserted him and fled. So as you say, he knew he was going to be betrayed. It was prophesied even. In fact, Jesus had to organise it by calling Judas into his inner circle. And yet he still went through with his agony. Yeah, and what I love about the story, by the way, is that, um, you know, this wasn't a fatalistic thing for Judas. Um, I, I still think it could have worked out differently. He had choice, all of us have choice. And the amazing thing is that throughout Jesus's ministry, he'd given Judas the opportunity. Why? Because he put Judas in charge of the money bag. He was the treasurer of the group. And we discover in the Gospels that why did he betray Jesus? Well, all sorts of reasons are given. You know, he wanted to provoke Jesus into raising up an army and being the Messiah as he thought he would be and so on. But actually the Gospels give us just one simple reason for it. He was greedy, he wanted money and he was lured by this promise of being given money if he betrayed Jesus. Now, here's the thing. All through these last three years, Jesus had trusted him with the money bag. Hmm. It's as if Jesus was saying, I know what you are, Judas. I know you're a cheat. And the Gospels say that Judas used to skim some money off the, the top. My goodness, can you imagine one of Jesus' own disciples helping himself to some of the money that had been given to support Jesus' ministry? And Jesus had given him the opportunity to change. It was as all, almost as if he's saying, Judas, I know what you are, I know who you are. I'm giving you a chance. You could be discipled in this, you could change, but of course he doesn't. And so eventually he does become the one of whom it's prophesied that one would betray Jesus. And here he is leading this mob, 
frankly. Let us not think here of, you know, a Roman soldiers, legion coming across to arrest him. This is a mob sent by the religious authorities with Judas to come and arrest Jesus. And the, the irony and the agony of what follows, the signal he's given to them is, look, it's dark, there's a number there, I know you won't know who Jesus is perhaps, so the one I go and kiss will be the one. Kissing, of course, was a very common greeting in those times as it still is in this part of the world. And so he goes up to Jesus, throws his arms around him, kisses him on the cheek, you know, and says, hey, Jesus, you know, greetings, Rabbi. Greetings, Rabbi. But he wasn't his Rabbi, was he? If he had been, he'd have listened to his teaching. And Jesus is betrayed by a kiss. I mean, they're two opposites, really, aren't they? And this is the depths that Judas had sunk to and Jesus simply says, friend, friend, <laughs> friend, do what you came for. And he no doubt beckoned the guys and they come arrest Jesus and they will take him away from here down this little remaining bit of the Kidron Valley up the other side and through the gates into Jerusalem. You know, here's another interesting thought. David, where you and I are sitting here in this garden, right alongside the Church of All Nations that commemorates this event, and where there's a bedrock exposed at the front of the church, which is supposed to be the very rock where Jesus agonized. As you sit here, and particularly in New Testament times, you would look across from this side of the hill to Jerusalem on the other side of the hill and the winding path that came down the side of the valley from the gate to the bottom of the valley and up. It's night time. They'd have almost certainly come with their flaming torches to light their way and scholars have often speculated that Jesus would no doubt have sat here and been able to see them coming for him. And he doesn't run. Why? Because, well, to use an expression in John's Gospel, now the hour has come, now the time has come for the Son to be glorified. And when we know it's God's moment, we don't run. We simply stand and wait to see what God wants to do. I'm conscious that betrayal is a common human experience for many people and very, very painful, for sure. But Jesus' betrayal, does that help us in any way come to terms with our betrayals? A betrayal is incredibly painful. Um, you know, whether it's by a colleague at work who did the dirty on you, set you up to take the fall for something that they did. Whether it's you're a church leader, and sadly, there are many stories like that where church leaders, priests, elders, youth leaders have been turned on by someone, someone you poured your life into. I can think back in my own life where that has happened, people you spent years and years and years pouring your life into, and for some reason you never quite understand, turn against you for their benefit. And it is deeply, deeply painful. You know, it's not something you shake off in a moment. But I think what sitting here in the Garden of Gethsemane underlines for us, for our Jesus then and now series, is that the book of Hebrews says that Jesus was tempted and tested in every way that we are, yet without sin, and tells us that he's our faithful high priest and it's because he went through everything in life that we went through, that he's able to both understand and intercede for us now at heaven at the right hand side of the Father. So I would say this, if you're betrayed, bring your pain to Jesus, it's very real. Come to him and say, Jesus, I know you understand because in that garden you were betrayed and you felt pain. But Jesus, I, I have a choice. I've either got a choice of working through that pain and coming out of it with you or sitting in it for the rest of my life. And I know you understand and I know you're in heaven praying for me right now. And I'm crying out to you, Jesus, deliver me from holding on to this betrayal. Free me from it 
because the person who betrayed me has gone off and gone on with life. And I refuse to be put in a prison by them. I'm going to believe that you've got the key to even today open the door to bring me out of this pit of betrayal. Because you were brought out of this pit of betrayal here in Gethsemane by your father. Got a bit worse before it got better for you. But oh my goodness, Easter Day was coming. And Easter Day is Resurrection Day. And Resurrection Days are what God always specialises in. With that thought in mind, Mike, just articulate that into a prayer for us. Lord Jesus, here in this place where you agonised with your Father and yet where you chose to accept to drink that cup of wrath, of righteous judgement, of my sin, of our sin, of the world's sin, where you chose for your Father's will to be done than what you in your human will would want. We thank you today that you did not shirk from drinking that cup because you love us. And Lord, in this place where you were betrayed, we pray today for all who still live in the pain of betrayal, that today they would decide to refuse to live in the prison that someone else has tried to put them in and leave them in. And they would come to you knowing that you understand for you were betrayed and even now you're praying for them in heaven, that that gate of that prison might be sprung open and that they might walk forth today out of that betrayal into whatever you have for them. For Lord, you are always the God of resurrection, always the God of hope and life. And for that we praise you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Mike Beaumont and David Taverner in the Holy Land, tracing the life of Jesus then and now. Check out the UCB website for the free episode guide with photos, Bible references and background information. Go to ucb.co.uk forward slash Jesus then and now. And you can hear more 30 minute conversations with Mike and David talking about the Bible on the UCB player app. Under podcasts, just select Bible books, Bible biogs or Bible surprises. Bible surprises.